Hello everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the first UNODC Women in Justice for Justice event on the first ever International Day of Women Judges. Um, we are all here because we recognize that we need more women in justice and women leaders in justice. And this first International Day of Women Judges is a milestone. So my name is Annika Markovic and uh, I am the ambassador and permanent representative of Sweden to the UN and the international organizations here in Vienna. And I'm both happy and honored to moderate this session today. I would like to begin by thanking UNODC Executive Director Ganavali for this excellent initiative and by welcoming our special guest, Her Excellency Alma Sadic, the Minister of Justice of Austria. I would also like to welcome our distinguished panelists who are mostly joining us virtually, but also in person. We have a lot to discuss over the next hour, so without further ado, I do invite Executive Director Gadavali to take the floor. And of course, she needs no further introduction, but I just want to underline that she is a true gender champion. So Executive Director, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Dear Minister Zadis, distinguished panelists, Ambassador Markovic, Excellencies, dear guests. Thank you all for joining us on this special day, the very first International Day of Women Judges. Today is a day to recognize the leadership of women judges in the pursuit of justice. It is an opportunity to celebrate champions for diversity and equality in the justice sector, both women and men, and to commit to more determined action to promote laws and institutions that protect and empower every one of us. General Assembly Resolution 75274, which proclaims the 10th of March, the International Day of Women Judges, recognizes that gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls are crucial for achieving all sustainable development goals and their targets. One of those targets, Target 16.7, calls for ensuring responsive, inclusive, participatory and representative decision making at all levels, including in the justice sector. We have seen tremendous progress towards this target. 40% of judges were women in 2017, which is 35% more than in 2008. But there is still more work to be done even in regions where women have made greater strides towards representation. In Europe, female judges and prosecutors outnumber their male colleagues, but women still represent only 25% of court presidents. A report from September 2021 found that in the United States, women now outnumber men in law schools, but they account for less than one quarter of equity partners in law firms. In the Americas, the share of women ranges between 41% for prosecutors and 48% for judges. In Asia, the share of women falls to around one third. And for other regions, more data is urgently needed to identify and address the gaps. In addition, the share of women among police officers globally is still very low, accounting for less than one out of six police officers. Equal representation matters. It is a goal in and of itself, and it is a pathway to greater justice. Where gender imbalances have been addressed, we can see that women's leadership brings positive systemic change. More women in law enforcement and criminal justice help to improve services and victim-centered responses and to build trust. More women in justice also means more understanding of the specific threats women and girls face, face such as femicide and gender-based violence. Increased diversity reinforces accountability and transparency, whether in the justice sector, the private sector, or anywhere else. We need more women in justice and in top positions. We need to understand and address the barriers women face so we can empower women beyond school to build career path and reach their potential. We also need to put in place laws that recognize the gender dimension of crime, and we need to build institutions capable of responding effectively. The UN Office on Drugs and Crime is committed to supporting gender responsive criminal justice and access to justice across our mandates on drugs, crime, corruption and terrorism through networks, guides, tools and training. 
We are scaling up prevention of gender-based violence in UNODC's broader work on crime prevention through sports and education, which can help to reach youth, especially young men and boys, and make them part of the solution. I'm also proud to note that just last week, the UN approved a new statistical framework to measure femicide that was developed by UNODC with UN Women. By providing a global definition for femicide, we can help ensure that each and every woman killed because of her gender is counted and that justice can be served. We can only solve a problem by acknowledging and understanding the problem. That is the goal of the initiative we are launching today. Women in Justice for Justice aims to advance women's representation and leadership in the justice sector, promote integrity and gender responsive criminal justice, and address gender-based violence. Improve the existing knowledge base, in particular to remedy regional gaps in data collection and analysis, and to celebrate women in justice for justice leaders, both men and women, through an awareness raising campaign in 2022. I'm looking forward to working with all of you on this important initiative to engender change across the spectrum of justice. Most of all, we need leaders and role models to drive change and to inspire the leaders and role models of tomorrow to keep advancing hard-won progress. As the late US Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. With this in mind, I'm honored to have a trailblazing young politician and lawyer like Minister Alma Zadish with us today. Dear Minister, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Executive Director Vali, dear Excellency, the Ambassador, dear participant. Oh, thank you so much. Despite these current troubled times, I'm truly honored to be here with you today on the occasion of the very first International Day of Women Judges. It is a milestone to mark the importance of women in the justice sector. And therefore, I want to congratulate you, dear Executive Director Vali, for launching such an important event, for launching such an initiative of, for women in and women for justice. You are a fighter and a champion for women's rights and for women in itself, for promoting women and supporting women. You did this throughout your career, and uh, this is one of the milestones uh, that you are setting this wonderful initiative also today on the very first International Day of Women Judges. Therefore, it's a great honor and a privilege for me to have the opportunity to open this great event with you and I have to say women can be change makers and we need the world to see that. And when we talk about the justice sector, the promotion of women's rights, gender equality and empowerment of women at all levels of the judiciary is key. And it's key because it has the justice sector has an implication on the society as a whole. Gender equality in the judiciary is not simply a matter of headcounts. It is a matter of legitimacy, of fairness, of integrity, but also of public trust and effectiveness. In short, it's a matter of rule of law. Therefore, it's imperative that the judiciary reflects our society and our complex realities and also reflects our experiences and therefore, it needs to be sensitive to all the issues of those who the justice sector serves, also all the women and all the girls. And this is why representation matters, why presence of women at all level of the judiciary matters. A diverse judiciary brings different voices and perspectives into the courtroom and also beyond. Representation is also reformation. Numerous studies prove that diversity strengthens the judiciary. It helps to overcome this implicit bias and this also these unconscious stereotypes. Above all, female judges have made groundbreaking decisions when it comes to combating all forms of discrimination, ranging from femicide to rape, from forced marriages to hate crimes, 
from the protection of reproductive rights to the strengthening of victim rights. And the late Supreme Court Justice, which was also mentioned by Executive Director Bali, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she's one of the many prominent examples who were leading and championing the justice system and the change. In short, women have been and they will continue to be key agents of change. And although the role of, the, of women in the judiciary has increased over time, the representation varies widely across different countries. And the gem, gender gap remains prominent. There are many obstacles to women's full and equal participation in the judicial profession, such as deeply entrenched gender stereotypes, as well as harassment, but also discrimination. When, when it comes to Austria, I would like to, to flag some important dates to you. In Austria, women were not allowed to study law until 1990. And the first two female judges were appointed in 1947. The, form, the first female judge at the Supreme Court was appointed in 1987. This means that in the current year, 2022, Austria celebrates the 75th anniversary of female judges in Austria and the 35th anniversary of, um, of a Supreme Court female judge. And if you look at the figures today, more than 50% of all judges are female, including the president of the Supreme Court. And the question that we need to pose is why was this possible? How did it happen that we that this change was possible? And if you look at it at a bit bit closer, the only it this was only possible because of the introduction of mandatory quotas in 1994. Until 1994, the proportion of female judges in the total number of judges was only 25 percent. And only 15 years after introduction of the mandatory quota, we achieved the benchmark of 50 percent of female judges in Austria's courts. And I think always when you, if you want to argue and when you want to argue for mandatory quotas for women, for their representation, this is an excellent example. However, there are still more men than female in leadership posi positions. Women continue to face more challenges than men. The glass ceiling, this invisible barrier that keeps women from achieving their goals and holding high level position is still there. And we do need to change this. We do need to break the glass ceiling. And what do we need to change this? There are three aspects that I identified also throughout my career. First of all, education is key. We need to offer specially designated training programs for women in justice. These activities can give women the opportunity to discover their strengths, their skills, but also build networks. And the second thing, thing that is also incredibly important, not only in the justice sector, are alliances. Formal and informal alliances. Partner up with your friends, partner up with your female friends, help each other in meetings, in discussions, refer to each other, point out how, the, how great the idea of your female colleague is, and you will see the change. Solidarity, dear women, is key, and we are stronger together. And the third thing is visibility. We need women to be seen as decision makers. Consider that when you organize panels. Um, last, uh, on the 8th of March, I had an all-female panel of female advocates for human rights uh, in the Ministry of Justice, and it was a great success. We need to make women in leadership position more visible. And therefore, I highly welcome this, the launch of this initiative, and I'm looking for, forward to a fruitful discussion with you all. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Minister Zadic and Executive Director Vali for your insightful remarks. And I'm really happy to hear that we are making progress, but more also needs to be done. And we got some very good examples from uh, and some good ideas from both of our keynote speakers. So I think I'm, you know, we are very happy for that. And I very much welcome the focus of this new International Day and the UNODC Women in Justice for Justice initiative as a long-time gender champion and a representative of a government with a feminist foreign policy, I'm truly convinced that increasing diversity, inclusion and representation of women serve to strengthen law enforcement and, and judicial institutions. So the representation of women in justice and ensuring a gender responsive justice system are crucial elements for building and safeguarding peace security, human rights and development. Fair, effective and efficient criminal justice systems for all also need to be responsive to all, including by addressing the unique needs and risks of women. So our distinguished panelists will address different facets of this issue and related challenges in, in greater detail. And as for the format of, of this panel session now, we would like to start with brief three minute interventions from all our panelists. And I will then pose a question to the panelists before we invite Minister Zadic and Executive Director Bali to provide their closing remarks. So to take action, uh, we need to better understand the challenges and opportunities that different parts of the world are facing in promoting gender representation and gender responsive justice. And our first speaker on the panel is Graciela Marquez Colin, who is the first woman to serve as president of the National Institute of Statistics and Geography of Mexico, and who previously served her government as Minister of Economy. Minister Marquez, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Executive Director uh, Gadawali, distinguished ambassadors, excellencies, colleagues, friends. Good morning, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to join you in this high level panel to celebrate not just women and gender champions in law enforcement and justice, but also to accompany the launch of the UNODC's initiative, Women in Justice for Justice. One of the most important directions of modern democracies is to achieve gender balance in all human activities. Justice is one of the most relevant of such activities where gender equilibrium must be accelerated. And of course, statistics is a relevant input for making visible areas where we need to strengthen this principle. My statistical information is a powerful tool for justice and, of course, for women in justice. I would like to share with you uh, that UNODC and the National Institute of Statistics and Geography of Mexico, INEGI, share a common vision regarding the importance of producing relevant data on crime and criminal justice, especially in making women visible in justice statistics. For a decade, our institutions have worked together to support countries around the globe to produce better statistics on these areas. Our achievements include the development and approval of an international crime classification for statistical purposes that countries are gradually adopting to improve the quality and completeness of their crime data. We acknowledge important data gaps that need, need to be filled specifically regarding different violence that affects women and girls. In this direction, as, as mentioned before, last week, the United Nations Statistical Commission endorsed the statistical framework for measuring gender-related killing of women and girls. This framework was developed by UNODC, supported by UNODC NEHI Center for Excellence after a global consultations in five continents. By adopting this framework, countries around the globe will be able to collect and produce statistics of the worst type of violence that exists against women, gender-related killings. As president of INEGI, 
I'm deeply committed in implementing this framework as it is crucial, a crucial step of mainstreaming the gender perspective in crime and criminal justice statistics. This framework is now part of our work protocols at INEGI to strengthen our contribution to make women in justice visible through government censuses, surveys, and administrative records. As the National Statistical Office, we provide on women's participation in the justice system and statistics on how Mexican women face the justice system. INEGI delivers data related to a number of female uh, judges but also data on the participation of women in decision-making levels across law enforcement, public defenders, offices, and human rights institutions. We know that women hold only a third of the top judicial decision-making positions, even when women stand for 50% of public servants within judicial institutions. We also know that women represent 46% of ombudspersons in Mexico not a minor role. We also explore how women interact with criminal justice in other branches of justice. Let me just mention two instances. First, our survey on violence against women is one of the most comprehensive surveys of its kind worldwide, and it collects data on women's experiences of violence in multiple domains. Second, in the last edition of our People in Prison survey, we captured data from all women in prisons across the country. We still have a long way to go, but if we want to shed light on, into inequalities, gender stereotypes and discrimination, we must be ready to expand our knowledge base and continue investing in producing more statistical data on crime and criminal justice responses. Congratulations, congratulations for the discussions on this very first day very first international date of women judges. I am sure that the statistics and justice together are creating a better world for women. Once again, thank you very much for the invitation. I am certain that institutional collaboration will have better and stronger results when we adopt a women in justice for justice approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think your message was very clear. We need to make women in justice visible. That's a, that's a wonderful message. And gender segregated data is certainly helping in, in that uh, context. So next on the panel, we have Jose Egreja Matos, who will speak to us here from the room about improving delivery of justice through gender representation and responsiveness. Judge Matos is the president of the International Association of Judges and a member of the advisory board of the UNODC Global Judicial Integrity Network, which was recognized in the General Assembly resolution establishing this International Day. Judge Matos, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, first and foremost, allow me to deeply thank UNODC and to praise its work now materialized on this new initiative, Women in Justice for Justice, to promote gender balance and gender responsiveness across the judicial systems. During the past years as a member of UNODC Global Judicial Integrity Network, I have had the privilege of witnessing the important goals in the justice area achieved by the network. It is crucial that a network made by judges and for judges continues with its excellent work, more strong, more engaged than ever before. The insidious evil materialized by corruption allied to the rule of men, the tyranny of men, driven mad by violence and destruction, show us our real commitment towards integrity and rule of law became a decisive answer to preserve a peaceful future. Ukrainian human judges are now living the same despair than their people, escaping with sheer anguish from their country, bombarded and destroyed. As the International Association of Judges clearly stated on February 25, only the respect for international law, for the principles developed and sustained by United Nations, can avoid the tragedy unfolding in Europe. 
it is impossible for me not to appeal the litigants involved. Please stop this horror. Gender equality in the justice sector is about democratic legitimacy, sustains rule of law. For that purpose, like in many other domains, a strong political will is decisive. Also, the presence of women in the justice sector, particularly of judges, sends a powerful message to younger women and girls about their, possi their possible upcoming professional goals. Knowing that women are selected to this position authorizes the assumption that the appointment procedure within the national judicial system is what, is what it is meant to be, meritocratic, transparent, non-biased. This is the only method to increase confidence of society in those who daily deliver justice. I believe that our efforts need to target directly men judges, allowing with other critical actors, male actors, lawyers, prosecutors, law professors, who have the skills to address gender-based discrimination. Unfortunately, gender equality continues to be perceived as a women's mission only. Gender injustice are present in very diverse organizational cultures due also to the general tendency to undermine this problem, if not simply to ignore it. The insufficiency of gender representation and responsiveness is notice noticeable, depending on the national context, on three major sceneries. First, the pure and undisputable absence of women judges, still a widespread problem. Then, the well-known deficit of inclusion, inclusion of women at specific ranks, namely highest courts or management bodies for the judiciary, as already pointed out before. And finally, the persistence of obstacles to judicial careers targeting women, particularly by disregarding their particular circumstances, for instance, as mothers. Voted president of the International Association of Judges, representing 92 national associations of judges around the world, 92 countries, I decided since my very first speech to define gender equality and parity within the judiciary as a crucial priority for my, my mandate, dedicating symbolically the election to the terrible ordeal of Afghan women judges, a matter still of enormous concern to all of us. The first International Day of Women Judges celebrated today shows the path towards diversity to be tailed for an inclusive future. For this goal, United Nations can always count on us on the International Association of Judges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge Matos, and uh, thank you for uh, highlighting the role of men in promoting gender equality in this field. And, and uh, I'm very happy to, to see that we have gender sensitive men like Judge Matos with us uh, in this process uh, to make gender equality a priority also in this sector. Um, our next panelist is the director of the Anti-Corruption Bureau of Malawi, Ms. Martha Zizuma. She will address the important role women can play in criminal justice to promote integrity and accountability, as well as the role of women as whistleblowers. Mrs. Chizuma, you have the floor. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you, moderator. I'm truly honored. You can hear me now? Okay. Yes, we hear you okay. loud and clear. Thank you so much. So I'm truly honored to be part of this uh, first ever event uh, for uh, commemorating women judges. Uh, I come from the part of the world where effects of lack of accountability and lack of transparency has fueled a serious plunder of public resources and also created other social evils. 
whose bluntness is largely felt by women. Uh, acute shortage of basic public services whose absence hit women more, lack of social safety nets, and increased susceptibility to gender-based violence like sexual harassment and assaults are some of the harsh realities that uh, women in Malawi face every day. However, within this context, my country has seen an outstanding interventions from women in the criminal justice system, being female judges or female lawyers. Um, uh, and these interventions have come in form of stiff sentences that we have seen uh, coming up from the courts, uh, passed to perpetrators of such crimes and other evils, and some furious and serious advocates uh, uh, by the women lawyers, uh, which we have, uh, where we've seen really powerful people being held to account for various evils that they have done. And the intensity and the quick manner by which such interventions have been made, especially in the recent times, uh, reflects the natural empathy and emotional attunement, uh, which was also present in men, is really more pronounced uh, in women. And that for me is one of the major justification for ensuring that we promote women in justice system because of the fact that they displace justice in an effective and impactful manner. Now, speaking for me as head of the Anti-Corruption Bureau, I, I, I come from, a, of course, a social justice background. I was previously Ombudsman of Malawi, so I've got that social justice background for me. And every day, I think it, it bleeds my heart when I see the files that are coming before my, my desk of uh, serious plan of public resources. All I'm seeing are those hospitals that have been taken away, uh, those medications, the schools that have been taken away uh, from the people of, uh, of this country. And this is one of the one of the I think one of the major thing that um, makes this doing this work worthwhile, uh, despite all the brutality and obstacles that you meet along the way. Uh, and this is one of the things that keeps me going and just makes me wake up again and do it again. Now, as to how we can promote women in criminal justice system, I believe, uh, as it has already been alluded to, um, uh, that the availability and accessibility of quality education up to tertiary level and also intentional policies by the relevant authorities to put women in criminal justice system um, uh, is paramount. In my country, we've seen some great strides being made uh, by the leadership in, in making sure that um, uh, there are a number, there are a lot of women judges on the bench. However, uh, once they are there, they also have to be supported uh, to be maintained in that uh, position. And what I've seen based on uh, what is happening in the country is that the greatest support uh, needs to come and it has come from other women. And my, myself, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great example of that. Um, my appointment, as I've said, I'm the first director general, a female director general of the Anti-Corruption Bureau. Uh, my appointment was as dramatic as it can be, um, where I was first at, uh, at first parliament um, refused to uh, confirm me, but it took uh, the public with the leadership of women organizations to put me here. And right now, um, as I've said, I, I am the first female director general, and I think I've taken a different approach to my work, which has uh, literally um, scratched in wrong places uh, some so many forces in the country. As such, my tenure is always under threat. Uh, but you see that there are always women who are advocating uh, for my maintenance in the position. But also, I've seen recently where, um, due to a number of reasons, um, I've to, to do with my work, I've been personally sued in court. And I was touched three weeks ago when one of the female judges or female lawyers, a group of female lawyers approached me, about nine of them, to say, we want to take your case pro bono. You go fight for against corruption in my country. We go fight for you. And for me, that's that's one of the greatest way we can help each other or promote each other as women in the criminal justice system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You have just given us a great example of, of why we need to have women uh, in the judicial system. So 
Thank you very much for the work that you are doing. And I think it was super important that you emphasize the availability and also the accessibility of education in order to promote more women in, in, in the justice system. And uh, what you have on your sign there, fighting corruption is everyone's responsibility. I think that's also a great message. So thank you very much. So before Thank I came you. to Vienna, I served as uh, Sweden's ambassador to the Netherlands and then I was also the permanent representative uh, to the International Criminal Court. And as an international gender champion there, I co-chaired the Gender Justice Impact Group, which focused on establishing a working definition of sexual violence in the context of international criminal justice. So it's therefore a special honor for me uh, to introduce Kimberly Prost, who serves as a judge at the ICC and who will address the needs of women as witnesses and victims. Judge Prost was previously also head of the legal advisory section here at the UNODC. So Judge Prost, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator, and it's a real honor for me to be uh, present today to participate with this illustrious panel and speakers. And of course, my, my thanks and commendation to my old alma mater, UNODC, for this wonderful initiative. While for years little attention was paid to the need to safeguard the rights of victims and witnesses in the justice process, today we are seeing much more emphasis on that, but there is still a long way to go. All witnesses and victims, of course, male or female, must be accorded respect and protection in the system. But the sad reality is that for many crimes, including violent crimes, domestic violence, sexual violence, overwhelmingly the majority of victims will be women. So when we speak of these safeguards, it is appropriate to focus particular attention on women as witnesses and victims. Judges, of course, have a major role to play in this, but there is a shared responsibility within the justice system. And I'm going to make three points in that regard. The first and most important interlocutors with witnesses and victims the police can do tremendous damage or be of tremendous benefit, both in terms of the well being and safety of witnesses and victims, and also in preserving the quality of the evidence that will ultimately be provided. So, the importance of proper training of police and sensitization of police in the treatment of witnesses and victims, especially female witnesses and victims in cases of sexual violence particularly, cannot be overemphasized. Moreover, what was mentioned earlier, simply an increase in the gender balance amongst police forces will have a natural effect and change the dynamic uh, in terms of these interactions with witnesses and victims. Secondly, not all legal systems allow for extensive direct interaction with witnesses by parties or participants in the justice system. But for those systems that do, the common law systems and international systems with an adversarial process, it is imperative that witnesses receive appropriate familiarization and preparation before they go into the courtroom to testify. To be clear, that does not mean witness coaching, but they must be fully informed of what they're going to face. They must be given prior statements and time to read them, and they must have the opportunity to interact with the calling party, the person who's going to question them in the courtroom, be it prosecutor or defense. These types of protocols being applied consistently will significantly enhance the comfort level, the protection and safeguarding of the rights of witnesses and victims when they reach the courtroom. And finally, the most important and challenging responsibility, especially again with sexual violence, lies with the judges who will either question or managing, manage the questioning in the courtroom. And in this, judges have to find and set the right balance by allowing the evidence to be fully tested in fairness to the accused, which is imperative, but at the same time ensuring questions are, are, are relevant, not unnecessarily intrusive, and at all times respectful. And this is perhaps our greatest challenge with victims and witnesses in the justice system because it falls to individual judges in the courtroom where it's impossible to regulate. 
What is needed, of course, as always, and it's something judges are very resistant to, wrongly so in my view, they need to be trained. They need to be specifically trained. They need to be taught expertise. We're not experts in everything and we need to acknowledge that. And again, I am a firm believer that the more we get to achieve a balance between male and female, not that there, there, is, it's, there are male judges who are fabulous at controlling this in the courtroom and female judges that may not be great at it, but the more you have a gender balance, the better there will be a natural development of sensitivity to these issues. So for me, there's lots of work in there uh, for all of us judges, but also for organizations like you and ODC uh, to help us along the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge Prost, for uh, emphasizing the need for gender sensitivity throughout uh, the process uh, for the police in witness preparation, and also for the judges. I think that's a very important message. So um, we had before a problem with our panelists uh, from Buenos Aires. How are we doing with that now? I'm looking over here, we're doing well, good. So addressing the needs of women, uh, accessing justice is essential to strengthening victim-centered responses to gender-based violence. And to discuss this important priority, I'm very pleased to welcome Ines, Monica Weinberg de Rosa, President of the Supreme Court of the City of Buenos Aires, former President of the UN Appeals Tribunal and former Judge of the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Judge Weinberg de Rosa, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, to uh, UNODC for this organization and for I'm very happy to be here with you today. In June 2015, the first New Una Menos campaign, which stands for Not One Woman Less, took the streets of Buenos Aires as well as other cities in Argentina and spread its message to Latin America and other continents. Mm -hmm. In 2019, the Congress enacted Micaela's law as a tribute to young Micaela Garcia, a victim of femicide in Entre Rios, a province in Argentina. The main goal is to set a legal mandate for every person working at any level of public office to attend seminars on gender issues and violence against women. However, it is worth noting that a decade before the judiciary, to the, new to the initiative of women judges, had already, had already started a process of training every person working there in gender issues and violence against women. In 2009, the Federal Supreme Court of Argentina created the Women Office within the court as to implement the provisions set forth by the law for the integral protection of women in order to put into practice both the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and the Inter-American Convention on the Prevention, Punishment and the Eradication of Violence Against Women. The following year, 2010, the Supreme Court of the City of Buenos Aires created the office the gender office within the court. The federal office studies the impact of violence against women and prepares since 2015 a national report on femicides. The numbers from the five uh, reports show that there were 287 in 2020 compared to 254 in 2016. The lockdown from 2020 partly explains the increase in that year. The gender offices, both of the Supreme Court and of the Federal Supreme Court and of the uh, City of Buenos Aires, provide training to members of the judiciary. During the COVID pandemic, the judicial training in the City of Buenos Aires was held online by the Center for Judicial Training within the Superior Court of the City. The Center for Judicial Training has offered 18 Michaela Law courses with different levels of training. During those courses, 2,531 people passed the first level, 1,112 the second one, and 357 the third one. 
as well as special editions for judges. Uh, as agreeing with Judge Prost that judges need to be trained. The road to equality is long, but the process is not stopping. Hence, the constant training on the elimination of any form of gender violence needs to be permanent and also permanently updated to include any tool available to achieve such goal. Our constant efforts will make it possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judge Weinberg de Roca. Um, thank you for emphasizing the need for training uh, on gender issues and violence against women. Uh, we have now spoken first about the accessibility and availability of education and now the continuous training uh, while you are in the system. So I think that's very important. Thank you very much. Um, women judges and prosecutors may outnumber their male counterparts in regions such as Europe. But in private practice, there is still a glass ceiling in place with women in the minority when it comes to making partner at law firms. And to address the gender gap in private law firms, we have a woman who is the CEO and founder of her own law firm, Riem Al Ansari. Dr. Al Ansari, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good morning. And good uh, your ex, your ex, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor to be present in the first, uh, very first occasion of first International Women's Day of Judges. Um, I cannot help it by only opening uh, my uh, speech with, uh, with this note. Uh, truly, my heart goes out for all Ukrainians, uh, Yemenis, Palestinians, and all those who are infected in the various parts of the world. Um, this is what I wanted to say. Uh, as far as uh, private sector and uh, practicing law concern, let me walk you through what I want to deliver today simply and smoothly. Uh, it all started with my very own story and how I got into this business. It was an incident that diverted my entire plan from being an investment lawyer to criminal uh, law uh, lawyer. Um, this is not what it's uh, all about. Uh, I sailed through this experience. I was devoted and committed. Yet when it came to an end, this slight shift from the practical aspect to the theoretical aspect or vice versa, there was a lot to handle. Uh, I were hearing, I started hearing phrases like, this is aggressive, um, it's masculine, it's not feminine. This is job for men, it's not, it doesn't suit women. So this, it's, it might be a personal encounter after all, yet it's more than meets the eyes. It's a summary of a unique, let's say, woman experience that combines both academia and practice that I would like to summarize in six major points today. The first point is that we really have to know the importance that us as a woman who paved the way already, we paved the way already, or we should create something that is called a healthy environment for the women coming after us. Particularly speaking, focusing on the role, be it a mother, sister, or even a wife. Example, simple examples of what I really wanted to deliver is tailoring, tailored working hours. Uh, let's say having special spaces for the children in the workspace so the mothers can attend their children. And we have this applicable in our country, which is uh, a milestone in, uh, from where I come. The second point, we all know that International Women's Day is pinned down in all, in all calendars. It's March 8th of every year. From my own perspective, I encourage to care and focus on making change happen rather than specify all the focus on uh, or efforts on um, frontiers and slogans. Let change speak for itself. Let's put things in practice. Um, the third point is how we treat or how we deal with ladies generally in the working space, even in my law firm. I would recommend to respect the amazing powers that ladies have and never give an assignment or even a mission a second thought, thinking that if it was a lady fit or it, it might be an overwhelming mission for a lady. The fourth point is we should put the phrase lead by example into practice. That is to say, uh, when you hire, you can hire Reem or you can hire John. Let it be whatever you hire. But what I really want to stress on, let the deliverable speaks for itself. Uh, what I really want to pass here is that the focus should be um, 
focusing on the goal or the solution rather than the problem itself. Let it come naturally. I would also highlight the misleading representation of the world vulnerable. Um, it's being marketed in social media platforms and also in classical outlets that women uh, should be vulnerable or she can use vulnerability in certain ways. Um, vulnerability doesn't mean something physical as it's been marketed uh, or not, not even something social. Uh, it's not that, it's particular concept that really serves the criminal justice particularly, and this is from my own, own experience. Um, in many cases, the responsive and aggressive individual cannot win the case. We need a calm and collected individual, particularly in criminal, criminal law cases in, in my country, let's say. Uh, and as they say, the slow and steady wins the race. Um, it's not about winning or losing, but it's about how we deal with cases. And uh, relating this or linking this time with the entire uh, point to the woman's nature, it perfectly fits the woman's nature. So vulnerability is not uh, is not, not something to be ashamed of. So we have to put things in context. One last thought is that uh, I really want to stress uh, on is the narrative. We should be careful about narratives and things that we talk about. If we change, if we just change the narrative, how we view women role as progressive and game changing role, rather than viewing the, the entire scene as women role versus men's role, it's not that. Um, another narrative can be, let us make such profession appealing, as my fellow panelists has uh, mentioned before, appealing and really attractive for future lady lawyers without, without uh, cancelling the men lawyers uh, role, because ultimately we complement each other. Uh, as far as data and uh, statistic and number concerned, I can provide you with a lot of numbers, but I can summarize and end my uh, intervention by saying in Qatar, we are on the positive end of spectrum. We just had a very updated list of uh, lawyers. Generally, it doesn't specify women or men, but filtering the, uh, the list, I can see as a, as a lawyer that the number has increased. Even as a law professor, as my fellow panelists stated before, in the university, I would say 70% of my classes are uh, women, not men. Uh, until this point, this is what I really want to deliver in this speech. Thank you for giving me the chance. And um, my sincere thanks goes to all you and the NDC uh, team for making this happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I think uh, your six uh, points are very insightful, and uh, you have really showcased yourself that you are putting in practice the leading by example and uh, uh, you know, focusing on the results. I think that's very helpful, so thank you very much. And my sincere thanks, now we are coming uh, to the end of, of the panel, my sincere thanks to our distinguished panel. Um, and uh, even though we are uh, coming to the end of the panel, I would still like to ask you very briefly as agents of change in your respective fields uh, to share one, one final insight with us today. So my question would be, what would you identify as the number one keystone action we can take to promote gender representation in the justice sector and gender responsive criminal justice? How can we make this change happen? And the first uh, person to speak on this is Judge Matos in the room, please. Thank you. So the first approach I will have on this question will be saying that this is a global problem, so we need global solutions. So the role of international organizations like UNODC and others like my own is crucial because the problem is transversal to different cultures, regions, countries, whatever. So global problem, global solutions. The second input I could I could mention is the quota. The, the, the success in Austria should be copy passed for, for other countries that could be that have a real problem, especially on having women judges on superior courts and in, in high judicial councils. So I think we could be more proactive on this regard. And, and finally, to redefine judicial careers because we have the, the, the concrete knowledge that many times women judges have, have a serious disadvantage regarding evaluation, promotion, 
because of being mothers, for instance, they 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 are they 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 want to be mothers. They should be mothers, but they should not be in risk of having a, a, a worse career, judicial career, because of that. So we must redefine judicial careers. It's not to protect someone; it's to treat differently what is different. And this is another issue that is uh, of our major concern. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now to Judge Prost, please. Thank you. Um, very briefly, I, I would like to echo what was just said uh, by a couple of previous speakers, uh, focusing on the international level and representation of judges and justice sector workers in, at the international level. Um, you contrast the International Court of Justice, where for years there was one of the 15 who was uh, a, a female judge. Uh, now they're celebrating because there's four out of the 15. You go to the Kosovo Specialist Tribunals, there's five female judges out of 23. And you go down the road here to the International Criminal Court and we have achieved parity, nine and nine. And why have we achieved parity? Because there are minimum mandatory voting requirements that force states to put forward qualified nominations of women for the, for the voting and states are required to vote for a certain level of women. It hurts me that that's the situation, but that is the reality. So internationally, I think that's a major concern. And secondly, the statistics of those who work at the courts and tribunals and the representation of women in management roles is shocking. It's at the International Criminal Court, we have one female director level, one in the whole of the International Criminal Court. So there is major work to be done focusing on why our hiring practices, why our competitions are not yielding better results in terms of better equilibrium at the management and professional levels of International Criminal Courts. And the one thing I will say, when you allow women into the game, as we've done in the International Criminal Circuit, you get amazing presidents very quickly and um, Judge, uh, Judge Weinberg de Rock is famous in that respect, Judge McDonald, Judge Fernandez here at the ICC. So it's all about getting that representation in and then we will prove what we can do. Thanks. Thank you very much. And then let's go to President Weinberg de Roca for the next comment. Thank you very much. Uh, I endorse what uh, the previous participants have said, of course. And um, I think a, a one line, it, it, I think it's very important that we women um, support other women. A great part of my career would not have been possible if other women had not supported me. And that I think is something we're still lacking. Uh, we don't, um, as a group, necessarily support our fem uh, female co um, colleagues or colleagues to be. So I think that is something we should work on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Couldn't agree more. Uh, President Marquez, please. Thank you very much. I completely agree with uh, the idea of uh, global solutions to global problems. And uh, in that, I think we need to go and take a step further. We, it's not, it's not uh, sufficient just to disaggregate the statistics between men and women. We need to take a step forward and try to in, um, include a gender perspective in all censuses all administrative records, all surveys, we can do it, but we need to launch initiatives at the global level. That's why adoption of international frameworks and standards are key for the success of national statistical offices in adopting this gender perspective in, again, all censuses, all administrative records, all surveys. It's it's very important and, and, and with this in mind, we will be uh, engendering, engendering data generation and collection. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Then let's go to Dr. Al Ansari, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, I would say uh, we should adopt the mindset of being uh, solutions uh, focused rather than uh, problem uh, focused. And I would say, because I'm coming from a different region, I would say we should take a step back and pause for a bit and create a tailored solution that, that perfectly fits the region. Uh, I'm saying that because we have, I wouldn't say restrictions or um, limitations, but sometimes when you want to pass a solution or we want to introduce an, a new idea, uh, you should also think uh, of the other end, how they're going to digest that or how they're going to take it in. Um, finally, I would uh, say the narrative again, because I've tried it before in the academic perspective and even in practice, it worked. Honestly, it worked here in my region. It worked when we focus on strengthening the role of women rather than focusing on uh, the gap between uh, having more men than women. Uh, it really worked. Uh, it's a su successful strategy and it's been tested here and tried in my law firm uh, in a small on a small scale and even in universities that I have taught local and international universities uh, in my classes. Very good point. Thank you very much. Then we are uh, going to Buenos Aires and Director Chizuma. No, sorry, not Buenos Aires, <laughs> Malawi, Director Chizuma. Thank you very much. I think in, a, in, my, in our context here, um, I think one way we can actually bring about um, uh, much representation in the gender sector uh, is to, we have all the laws, we have the laws, we have the policy frameworks, but there's need for courage and intention, intentional uh, application of those laws uh, without giving any other excuse as to why you cannot put women in some various positions within the criminal justice system. Related to this also, I think, is to ensure uh, that there are a number of trainings and also engagement with our men folk um, to be more responsive to issues of the gender uh, in the criminal justice system since the field is too big and we cannot literally do it alone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very important point. So we are coming to the end of what I think has been a very inspiring hour. And uh, I'm now really eager to hear what you think, Minister Sadic. Um, thank you very much. I first of all, want to thank all the participants for those very insightful and uh, engaging um, contributions and in, uh, interventions. Um, a lot of what you said resonates so well with me and I would like to point out maybe um, two things that uh, uh, that came up to my mind during your uh, interventions. Um, once again, it's underlined what I also said at the beginning that alliances is key and what we can also see from uh, the intervention of the director Chizuma she said that when she was, um, she only is in this position because there were so many engaged NGOs, uh, women initiatives that went out to the street and supported her, that showed the courage to support her to, um, to become the Director uh, General of the Anti-Corruption Bureau. And I think that's, uh, um, that's such a powerful story that shows how important it is, it is to ally with your female friends and to support your female friends, to support each other um, and, and to establish those networks within each other. Um, also throughout my career, I was supported by a lot of other female um, friends in different steps I took. And that's something that I want and that I also so, um, that I so strongly um, wa want to share because the only reason I entered politics is because a friend, a female friend of mine, encouraged me to change from the um, from the law firm um, I was at to, um, to to join a political party, um, and she was the reason I did it, and she supported me also throughout the next steps I took. Um, so I think that's one of the uh, one of the keys, and it works all over the world. It's not something that it just fits for one region. I think it fits every region. Um, and it's it, it's it's key, and I just would like to um, to appeal to our female solidarity. Um, 
And another point that I would like to um, to underline is this importance of representation, being it um, in, in the police, um, but also, of course, in the justice sector, because when you have women in the police, they have a, se a special sensitivity to female issues. And in particular, when it comes to gender based violence, it is the females that have a, that are sensitive to those to to those different issues that are necessary when you have a witness in front of you um, and when you have victims in front of you. Um, and that's why this representation at the police, but also uh, within the justice system is of, uh, of great importance. And the third point um, that also resonated with me when um, what also um, Dr. Alansari said, um, she said one thing, Taylor, uh, well, she said many things, but one thing uh, stuck to me so much, tailor the working hours so that it fits women's needs. Um, and I think on the one hand, that's incredibly important because when we have, we know the statistics, once a woman gets pregnant and has a baby, this income gap um, increases because the, you can see it then 10 years later, those women that had babies Earn 50% less than they male um, than their male um, fellows, and this is where you need to support women. We all, in particular, in in those circumstances, we need to change this. We need to to change that women have a negative effect just because um, they they have a baby, um, and it is possible to tailor working hours. I myself got a child a year ago and I'm trying to make it possible. I, I mean, I, I am in a privileged position. I can move around my, my schedule, but I'm trying to make it possible to bring the child to bed. And I think this is something um, that we need to make enable um, and provide for other women who work for us as well. Um, and the third point, we should not leave the men out because the care work at home should not only be carried by the female, but also by the men. So we need to provide these working hours also for our male colleagues, because also they need to bring the child to bed. This is uh, my final statement. Thank you. So true. Thank you very much. Executive Director Gadavali, please. Thank you very much. It's been indeed a very inspiring hour with many, many good ideas. And I would really, I have listened very carefully and I have taken notes because I, uh, I've been thinking about programs and projects and interventions based on each and every idea that was mentioned. So we heard education alliances, uh, uh, training, uh, meritocracy, you know, healthy environment, leading by example, training judges and police and, and uh, uh, and the witnesses themselves, uh, gender balance. We've heard many ideas and those ideas are all very important and uh, we're going to work uh, to make them uh, uh, operational. So uh, I would like to conclude by um, my warm thanks to Minister Zadic and to our distinguished panelists for helping us to launch Women in Justice for Justice with genuine passion and calls to action. I would also like to uh, take a break here and welcome the, the many young law students who have joined us uh, from universities in Austria. It is very important that you are with us today. Uh, you are the leaders of tomorrow. You are the agents of change and you will be the champions of, of such a cause. So together we can strive for gender equality and women's empowerment from law schools to the bench through mentoring, training, outreach and awareness raising through improved data collection and research, and we heard the importance of the quality and completeness of crime data, targeted legislation and responses. We can transform mindsets, build institutions and develop capacities. We must work together so that women are represented across the whole chain of justice, from women lawmakers to women in police stations. And we heard also speakers uh, um, uh, mentioned how important this is, social work services and courtrooms. UNODC will advance efforts towards these goals through our programs and through the UNODC Global Judicial Integrity Network, which was recognized by the General Assembly Resolution for its efforts to incorporate women's representation issues into judicial systems. 
We will be reaching out to permanent missions as well as to professional networks and associations, law schools and civil society, and working with our field network on targeted regional and national initiatives based on the, on the many good ideas we have heard today. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by applauding women judges around the world, as well as women prosecutors and public defenders, lawyers, jurors and witnesses, police officers, prison staff and service providers. We salute the women serving in border protection, customs and coast guards. We remember that every woman judge who is helping to uphold the highest standards of the law was once a girl who deserved every opportunity to reach for the stars and we resolve to leave no one behind. This day is a tribute to fairness and excellence and to every man and every woman who strives for equal treatment, equal opportunity, and who wish to take their kids to bed. Mm -hmm. To all who commit to reflecting our communities in all their diversity for greater justice for all. Thank you. Thank you all very much for participating today. Thank you to the wonderful panelists. Thank you, Minister Zadic. Thank you, Executive Director Gadawali. We are all agents of change, are we not? I mean, let's go out there and start changing. Thank you.